Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, today we ask that you would strengthen us to see your glory. To see your glory where you have placed it. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. The text for this morning's message is the Old Testament reading, but it's also the Gospel reading. This account of the transfiguration that begins to draw to a conclusion with this sentence. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. This is our text. Grace, mercy, and peace to you all through God our Father and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory. Glory is a big word, and we use it for a lot of things. I was teasing pastor in the second service about how when some people get excited or very thankful for a gift from a gift from God, they say, Amen. But pastor always says, Glory. And God does show us his glory in many in various ways, through the gifts he gives us day in and day out. Glory is such a big word. It's only five letters, but it's a big word. It's also a little slippery, or maybe uh, better said, it has a bit of flexibility to it, as many words do. Glory, in one instance, may look quite a bit different than glory in another instance. Not all glories are the same. I've heard a, a game-winning shot from half court right at the buzzer. I've heard that described as glorious. It was a glorious moment. You just had to be there. But the birth of your firstborn, as glorious as the three-point shot might be, the birth of your firstborn is a different caliber of glorious. And even according to the dictionary, you have two different options. Glory, on the one hand, it can be defined as high renown or honor won by notable achievements, but it's also defined as magnificence, great beauty. So the one glory has to do with things that get done Accomplishments. The other glory has to do with things looking nice. And so, keeping in mind the flexibility of this word glory, it is with a bit of trepidation that I ask you a question this morning. And that is, can you see him? Can you see him there on the mountain, wrapped in glory? It was a sight to behold. He was in the presence of Almighty God, overshadowed by the thunderous, potent, mysterious cloud of God's presence. And then he left God's presence. He came down the mountain, and he brought with him in his hand the words of the covenant. The Ten Commandments. And when the people saw him, their instant reaction was fear. Fear. They were afraid. Because Moses' face has somehow picked up, is somehow reflecting, radiating the glory of God. And the people were afraid. They were frightened by the glory of God, even though they were getting it second hand. They were still so frightened that for most of the time, Moses took to wearing a covering around his face. The people simply could not stand even a reflection of God's glorious holiness. They were afraid. 
And there was much to fear. Not only the glory of the face, but also the glory of what Moses held in his hand. Ten commandments from a perfectly holy God. A God so holy and pure that simply being in his presence could make the face of his prophet radiate with an unbearable brilliance. And these these commands, these ten words, these ten sayings that would go down not just in Christian history, but in all of history as ten succinct to the point commands that cut to the gut anyone who dares read through them. As God's standard for life, they condemned everyone who heard them, as they do us. The command, the first command, forbidding all other gods, We know how that hits us when we daily kneel at the altar of our finances or our sports teams or our happiness. That's a big one. Our leisure. We know what these commandments bring about. The commandment to honor his name. When I know I'm not the only one who on your average weekday goes out and lives a life that is virtually identical to those who do not bear God's name. We know what these commandments do. We know that their reaction there as Moses comes down is understandable. Fear. Fear of guilt. Because they, we, are guilty. And our guilt does not mix with his radiant, pure, blistering glory. And so I ask again, can you see him there on the mountain, wrapped in glory, surrounded by by a glory cloud God's presence, shaking from the shock, overwhelmed by the raw, otherworldly power before him, confused, almost out of his mind. Can you see him as the man he has known and loved allows his divine nature to seep through his human nature? For just a few brief moments. Can you put yourself in the sandals of Peter atop that mountain of transfiguration? Heart thudding, palms sweating, knees beginning to buckle as he sees his friend transfigured before his eyes. As he witnesses a tiny fractional percent of God's glory literally shining through his teacher. Shining so brightly that even his clothes on his body begin to glow white hot. The sight alone fills Peter with terror. He'd only ever seen this man as just that, as a man. This was something more, something indescribable, and it was scary. And equally terrifying was who Jesus was talking with, Moses and Elijah. Two men who together represented the entire history of God's people. Moses, the one whose face had shone on Mount Sinai with the radiance of God, once again stood in that same glory atop a mountain. Whoa! And here was little old Peter 
a fly on the wall, so small, so insignificant. Elijah was there too, the prophet of prophets who had served as God's representative on earth, now stood here with Christ, God himself, on earth. And little old Peter, seeing it all, overwhelmed with fear, driven to a desperate confusion with fear, to the point where he blurts out the crazy idea of constructing a shelter. Yeah, right, Peter, a shelter. Great idea, a shelter for the almighty creator of the heavens and the universe and the two greatest prophets to ever walk the earth. Oh, Peter. But it's the fear talking. How could it not? As Peter realizes what many a human being has often realized often at the saddest, worst, most tragic moments in life. A truth that we are often reluctant to acknowledge, that God is scary. An all-powerful being, without limit, beyond any kind of human control or manipulation, Are you kidding me? God is terrifying. So too is what this this thunderous voice booms from the cloud. Words Peter had perhaps heard before at Christ's baptism, but perhaps not. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. The terror of those words spoken at that moment. Because if it wasn't clear up until that point, it was clear now. Jesus wasn't just a man, a human, doing miracles, being used by God. Jesus was, according to this booming voice, the Son of God. He was as much God in his nature as your sons are human in their natures. They can't help but be human. That's what they are. And all of a sudden, Peter realizes that this Jesus is completely God. Which is terrifying. Because God is beyond the control of any human. It also means that this whole Christ thing, this whole Savior thing, was completely dependent on Jesus' willing choice. There is no one, nothing, forcing Jesus to do anything. This glory is a fearful thing. Which leads me to ask again, can you see him there on the mountain, wrapped in glory, surrounded by a descended darkness, rumbles of wrathful thunder shattering the air around him, the ground shaking underneath him? Can you see him there on that mountain in his glory? Lifted up for all to see. Wrapped, not as our pious renderings of him, but as he was. With nothing. Laid bare, a shameful sight for the entire world to behold. Wrapped in nothing but a crown made of thorns that are about the length of your fingers. Pressed into his scalp. Can you see him in his glory as the presence of God radiates out for all to see? The presence of God in human blood and torn flesh. 
Can you see this glory? Not all glories are the same. This glory does not lead to fear. This glory leads to peace. This glory leads to hope. This glory is the answer to our guilt from all those broken commandments Moses held in his hand. The Apostle John wrote, You may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the payment of our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Because of the bleeding, dying, ugly glory on this mountain, not Mount Sinai or the Mount of Transfiguration, but the Mount of Calvary. Because of this, Jesus Christ looks at you, and then he looks back at his Father in all of his eternal, all-powerful, terrifying glory, and he tells the Father, paid for, mine, this one need not fear. This glory, crucified on dying on the Mount of Calvary, is the answer to the terror Peter felt as God made himself known on the Mount of Transfiguration. Scripture says that there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. See, the glory of this final mount today, Mount Calvary, is that this mount provides a safe way. Because of this mount, there is no fear for the Christian. True, as a rule, God's presence equals fear. But the perfect love of Christ has cast out that fear for you. There on that mountain, the glory there, radiating off of Moses' face, it simply pointed to this glory. The glory there on the Mount of Transfiguration, surrounding terrified Peter, it simply pointed to this glory. Because on this mountain, we have a Savior. On this mountain, we have a safe way. On this mountain, we are forgiven all of our debt, all of our guilt. I love the, the verse in our text today that I read at the beginning. After all the terrifying sights and, and sounds, and after they've suddenly whoosh, vanished, the disciples looked up, and they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. These words are instructive for us today. If you want to see God's glory, if you want to know how God feels about you, if you want to know how you stand before God, look up and see Jesus only. The glory of the commandments that Moses held in his hand cannot help you. You can try to keep them. You should try to keep them. But ultimately, you're going to need something more. And even the glory of being literally in the presence of God, like Peter, wouldn't help you. I guarantee you, your constitution is no stronger than Peter's. That presence would only astound and frighten you. That's not the glory you need. You need the glory of Christ and the glory of his cross. So this week, when in doubt, look up and see Jesus only. Amen.